This is InfoSec Decoded number 40, Shock Prime. And I'm starting off with quantum mechanics, which is one of my passions. And I read this article. This is apparently, someone thinks this is a new theory. I remember feeling like this is what they taught me in college. First thing I got from the third book in quantum mechanics I read. Um, the point is, there is no objective reality. I thought this was well understood. The Buddhists understood this forever. I thought the quantum, this was the point of quantum mechanics. And these guys say, now Newton thought that the world was there with three dimensions and the planets and stars and rocks and everything are really there, whether you're looking at them or not. And if you took away all the rocks and planets and everything, there would just be this empty space that was just sitting there. Now that's the old Newtonian model, but the whole point of quantum mechanics is you have no evidence of that and you would never know if the world is really there. All you know is the result of experiments. You do an experiment and quantum mechanical equations predict the probability of getting a result. And this is what Kant figured out. All you ever know is your experiences. You really have no idea what's really out there. You only know experiences. And the point of this is everything is relative. You, you only exist in that you interact with something else. Anyway, that, that it's an interest, they're touting this as a new theory. So I guess there must be some subtlety beyond what I thought was pretty clearly in my textbooks. But I remember that, that sounded insane. And then suddenly the light came on. They all said after a third book in quantum mechanics, you suddenly understand it. It makes perfect sense. It describes the result of experiments. Right. It does not describe some absolute world that's out there like Newton did, which is completely unnecessary and not the result of experiment. Right. Um, so in Western philosophy, uh, the uh, base axiomic truth is, I think, therefore I am. And uh, in other cultures, especially like African cultures, for example, it is believed that um, I am because you are. And it turns out that quantum mechanics seems to be hinting at a more, uh, that the um, non-Western models uh, tend to be a more accurate reflection of reality in that sense. Well, yeah, I normally understand this. I think therefore I am. I would say I experience things. Exactly. Those are real. And, you know, any, any Buddhist or uh, even any uh, general mystic would tell you this whole concept of the I is not based on evidence. You're a chain of experiences. And I think it's important time is just a, a series of events. And the idea that there is this absolute time kicking by in seconds that goes at a steady rate is also completely unnecessary. All you need is a sequence of events like pages in a book. Anyway, uh, I find this stuff very interesting, although it has no immediate practical application, I suppose. Anyway, then Caitlin has got Booz Allen Hamilton. Yes, Boo, Booz Hamilton uh, contractors for the government uh, have been paying ransoms <laughs> to ransomware people, even though the FBI says that you know they'll they'll never pay. You know, but Booz Allen, like I said, they're, they're basically like the the red team for the government. In a lot of ways and here they are going around paying the ransomware people as, assumably you know on behalf of the u.s government which is ridiculous like don't well, from what that. i hear everybody pays the only question is whether you'll lie about that you pay don't pay your yeah, your, your pay. opinion has been noted but in reality there are pressures and everybody pays go broke don't pay. Don't worry about your business. Just make the, 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 the cyber criminals go away. Yeah, well, you know, that, that idealistic argument needs a whole lot more support than that in order to win. And maybe some more funding. Or you could just pass a law against paying, and then they would break the law and pay. But you know, then they'd also have to pay more lawyers. But anyway, it's um, this is a tough one. I remember I had the same feeling about human ransom. I said, you know, if anybody kidnaps me, don't pay. I'd rather die. And people said, yeah, you might have that attitude, but the rest of us don't have that attitude. And I said, yeah, you kind of got a point. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Irvin has got the antitrust bills. Remember reading about these? Yeah, this article that I put in here is, uh, is could, it's a good meaty article to explain the six bills that are running through uh, Congress right now. Everything from raising the merger fee to antitrust enforcement to preventing uh, things like TikTok from getting acquired, uh, all kinds of things that are going to affect Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, the, the big tech. 
Now, Trump was going to force TikTok to get acquired. Yeah, that never happened. Well, it didn't happen, but I didn't know there was a desire to prevent it. But yeah, I mean, but I don't think any of this is going to happen to you. Me, no, no, I think these are all great ideas. And I'm pretty sure as they run through Congress, they're going to get watered down or not funded or something. And it's just not going to happen. No, I think that um, I think the fundamental problem is that the antitrust laws were written in the days of like standard oil and stuff. And the point was they would have to show rising prices and the current tech giants give away stuff for cheap or free. So you can't win in court because the harm they're doing is not as simple as just doubling the price of everything. Yeah. And the laws are not really built to stop that. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't think they'll, they'll pass the way they are now, but it's interesting to watch them try. Yeah. And, and by the way, I have some sympathy with Bill Gates, you know, when Bill Gates, Microsoft ruled the world for a while. And they tried to break him. I came to break him up. And he said, you don't need to break us up. We're like running as fast as we can just to keep up. And before long, we'll stumble and fall. You don't need to break us up. Yeah. Nobody can sustain this dominant position for long anyway. Mm -hmm. I think that might well be true. Mm -hmm. I guess we're going to see. Amazon and Google have held it. And Apple have held the peak for a while. But, you know, it's not like they're sitting on their hands. Right. Right. I guess we'll see. Anyway. All right, and Matthew Prado, welcome. And you, got article, you got this article about Windows 11, yeah. Yeah, Windows 11. So this one seems to be um, quite controversial compared to Windows 10. Windows 10, they were trying to get everyone onboarded. They even forced some people to upgrade. Now with Windows 11, it seems like an exclusivity party. First, you need a high-end CPU, and now you need a TPM chip. Not to mention all the hoarders who are planning to buy up all the TPM chips because as soon as something is needed, they love to hoard and shoot up the price, and ruin it for everyone. Yeah, what I've heard is that you can't get them anyway because there's a chip shortage. Yep, that too. So it's only adding a list to the whole dumpster fire that Windows 11 is already before launch. Well, you know, somebody uh, last week was talking about Microsoft's pattern of a good one and a bad one. And they said Windows 11 would be the bad one. And it reminds me of Vista in that what is the point? What is the great new feature you got to have it for? Is there anything that it gives you that you don't already have in Windows 10 that matters? Support after 2025. Yeah, well, you know, that's what Microsoft, I mean, that's the thing. And I'm just like Vista. I was the first guy jumping on Vista saying, let's check this out. And then it was pretty horrible. And I sort of, well, I actually got certified in Vista. And then I took a class. And I remember the first edition of Vista was not bad at all when it was still called Longhorn. Well, you know, the first version of Vista was Windows XP Service Pack 2. They gave away all the good parts of Vista to beef up XP because people were getting owned right and left. And after that, there was no new feature to put in Vista. But, but anyway, I, I got certified. And then I immediately, as rapidly as possible, moved on to Windows 7. And I had a student in my class that said, hey, I really need that Vista certification because I work for the Army and the U.S. Army is totally standardized on Windows Vista. Because oh, they're God. they're famous for doing this, you know. Uh, they always pick like the worst option and make it universal. Anyway, they'll probably standardize on Windows 11 now too. Anyway, I got a I got the Windows 11 leaked version. We were using it in class, and man, it's, it seems kind of interesting, but it goes crazy. It uses up tons of CPU. It crashes your VM. It crashes the host underneath the VM, and and it continues to process even though it's idling. I noticed that on my on my VMware. Uh, last, yeah, this, last, yesterday morning, I jump in and I hear one of them working hard. And I'm like, wait, I don't have a VM doing anything. And it was Windows 11 uh, hanging around 50%. I took that out right away. Well, you know, if I could actually get the official Microsoft Windows 11, maybe it would be better. But, you know, maybe I've done enough experimenting with Windows 11 for one lifetime. Anyway. Yeah, and uh, keep in mind, too, that apparently you are using a development build. And yeah. they are likely not using optimized builds, of builds course. for that. And there's probably a lot of debugging code and stuff running in the background. So yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's not it's not Microsoft's fault that that leaked build I wasn't supposed to use anyway doesn't work. But but it is their fault that they're pushing this thing out and there's still no killer feature. You have to have some. You need to get it to do this awesome thing, or else why would anybody care? The, the other thing too is um, I was watching a YouTube video before I was falling asleep. And this guy had like six PCs and all of them were, were pretty new. They, they were, you know, less than five years old. 
But like apparently only one of them met the quote unquote requirements for Windows 11. And it's totally artificial requirements. Like there's no reason why a, a, a dual core CPU from 12 years ago couldn't run Windows 11 other than Microsoft really wants to market this towards newer computers. So I guess that's their market. Think of this from a marketing perspective, not a technical perspective. Who are they selling Windows to? They are selling Windows to PC manufacturers. They are not selling them to users anymore. And how do you get, how do you appeal to PC manufacturers? Well, you tell, you make the PC manufacturers tell their customers that you need to upgrade. Well, you know, I thought Microsoft started selling their own hardware in their mission to imitate Apple and they had their service and everything. Why aren't they selling us the computer to put Windows 11 on? That would they be are. money. They are, they absolutely are. You can go to the Microsoft store and buy their Surface Book Pro that'll run Windows will 11 just fine. Test? It, will it pass the Windows 11 test? Because I never heard of anything passing the Windows 11 test. And that would be pretty hilarious if the Microsoft apps hardware won't pass the test. Anything you buy recently from Microsoft, I'm pretty sure will pass. Anything above a, um, a Ryzen 3000 series or an Intel um, i whatever 8000 series will we'll run Windows 11 5. And that includes all of uh, Microsoft's current offerings. Oh, well, then that's clearly your pitch. Stop using that junk and go to genuine Microsoft stuff. Anyway, all right, and Alan's got uh, an OSN article. Yes, uh, well, the Wall Street Journal has an exclusive, an article written by Py Byron Tao about a certain Premise Data Corporation, a San Francisco-based company that recently raised quite a lot of money in a funding round that apparently is providing intelligence to the U.S. military by crowdsourcing information, crowdsourcing tasks that people in many countries around the world get paid usually a pittance to do random uh, odd tasks such as walking around a neighborhood while the app is running or counting the number of ATMs in a certain area or just follow, uh, filling out uh, surveys and polls. And apparently the US military is using this to presumably gather intelligence on um, uh, what is uh, open source, it does not require clandestine activities, but um, is otherwise inaccessible to them. And they can do this on the cheap. So Premise Data Corp uh, also uh, sells its services to various commercial interests just to gauge consumer interest and this, that, or the next thing, but it is also being used uh, as an open source intelligence tool. Interesting development there. Yeah, it's not clear what it means. I mean, in a way, this is nothing more than what tracking cookies do or mechanical Turk. This is true. It's a lot like crowdsourcing uh, activities like mechanical Turk. However, it's explicitly for the purpose of gathering intelligence and it's a private company that's uh, facilitating this. Yeah, it reminds me of H.B. Gary Federal, which was beginning, you know, years ago, they were going to find anonymous by correlating all the social networks and figuring out who was related to who. You know, this is the whole kind of principle of data mining. If you knew something like all the pizza orders on the planet, you could predict everything from that. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it's probably true if you really were to get enough data of high enough value, you could deduce uh, economic catastrophes and wars and famines and military invasions and stuff from it. Yeah, I, I do wonder how many participants they have. Yeah, I remember when I first got my Safeway loyalty card, I looked at that and I said, this is keeping track of all the food everybody buys in all of America. And I thought, I was a database engineer at the time. And I said, man, if I had that database, I could really do stuff. And I mean, the simplest thing you could do is make sure none of the food ever spoils and you never run out of anything. You could make sure that every store has the right amount of everything because you know how much they're going to sell but you could do a lot more than that. You could predict health, you could modify your sales to like change how many people smoke and what kind of food people eat. And you could move people from one location to another. You could really manipulate society a lot with that kind of data. Anyway, all right, now let's go back up to uh, OB. Oh yeah, there's a SOC Prime, the one I named this after. I thought this was very interesting. The SOC Prime website has the attack framework, but it sort of turned it around and made it much friendlier to use. And they've added all the different kinds of attacks 
like drive by compromise, they have information. And then for a lot of them, they have examples and they have Yara rules to pick up these attacks when they come in. So I think I'm totally going to use this in my instant response classes. We got a lot of them. We're doing one at Black Hat and some at DEF CON and such. And this is a very handy list. And I think this is the real step forward of security metrics. You have one thing that I thought was kind of hilarious. I was looking at right before there's about 300 attacks and they just brought out defenses of which there are about 12. And that reminds me of why, uh, you know, Liz and I keep getting emails from some journalist that wants us to go on and show and talk about ransomware. And the thing is I got nothing. I don't know what you should do to stop ransomware. I don't think anybody does. I listen to all the talks. Nobody really seems to know what to do. They all just say the same stuff, change your password, segment your network, put on the updates. I say, well, yeah, that's all we got. <laughs> and it's woefully inadequate. Anyway, I think this is a, I'm very much a fan of the attack framework and now the defense framework. I think this is helping to organize our thinking and our tools and everything. Anyway, and it, it serves as a list of all the things our students should understand among other things. Anyway, Caitlin is never going to use a Microsoft account. Never, never, ever. Although I do think I'm actually logged into one right now by accident. Um, anyway, see. yeah. <laughs> so you failed to live up to your own standards. I, I failed to live up to my own standards, yes. Um, so yeah, so I got stuck with it. So um, I got Windows 10 when it first came out. And I didn't quite realize that like, you know, what Microsoft was doing with the, you know, login with your, you know, Microsoft, I, I didn't realize it was actually like the Microsoft, I don't know. No, it was just when, when Windows 10 first came out. Life better by putting everything <laughs> in the cloud like Apple, which is glorious and everybody yes. needs, you should do it. Yes, exactly. So, so yeah, so Microsoft's totally taking a, a, a page from Apple, which by the way, I don't like on Apple devices either, where like my iPhone, like the login to my iPhone, I use my iCloud <laughs> or my iTunes password, like where I buy music. What? <laughs> That's ridiculous. I'd rather have my device separate and usable without the internet, um, just personally. Uh, that's the way I would like to do things. Um, I don't like it when Apple does it, and I don't like it when Microsoft does it. Of course, Microsoft has always been the enterprise, you know, powerful computer dealer, operating system creator person, and corporation, evil corporation that wants to enslave us all. Anyway, so... I'm not the only one that feels this way. Extreme Tech has a person, uh, Joel uh, Hruska, uh, talks about how this person doesn't want to log into their Microsoft account either <laughs> just to get into their computer. Like, why is that necessary? And I, especially when you're running at like 20 virtual machines, what's the deal with creating all these like Microsoft accounts? I just would rather use local accounts if I'm running 20 or 40 virtual machines. That's ridiculous. So you resist progress. I resist progress. I, why do things have to change? There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's it. Yep. I have this feeling everybody in tech has ADHD. Yeah, no. It, well, it's not just that. It's also, of course, the fact that you, since you're using a, and we were just talking about this, like what, since we are logging on with a Microsoft account that collects telemetry data, they really are spying on you and collecting data. And I mean, well, actually, I don't know if Microsoft is. They they're, absolutely are. They absolutely are collecting data on you well, and what you do on your system. They're not targeting ads. What do they actually want? Oh, they do target ads, actually, in the start menu as well. Yes, yes. There are now ads in Windows. Oh, so they're imitating Google in addition to Apple. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, well. And, of course, you know, targeting pro you know products and stuff to you as well. Um, so well, you know, out of the big, out of those three, Microsoft is the only one that never pretended not to be evil. Right from the start, they said, we're here to make money by any means available. Right. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm usually not not the one I'm to go around and claiming, you know, oh, our privacy is invaded or whatever. But it is somewhat a little too much to have the operating system that you're like, you know, running your virtual machine on, especially when you start doing sensitive work, knowing that it like spies on you and stuff, um, because then you're never entirely sure that your sensitive documents or, or sensitive information isn't being leaked out in some small way, um, yeah, either through a side channel or. Yeah, well, I always figured it's the same as iCloud. It's a way to deal with tech support because 90% of the problems are, I lost my phone. How do I get my stuff? And therefore the answer is it's gotta be in the cloud somewhere. Right, well, th that would be great if it was just the password. But like I said, uh, there's a whole bunch of privacy stuff that they collect, a lot of telemetry data, in addition to just your password to being able to reset it. 
yeah. remotely. Um, and that would be a good feature. Like if, if it was just not logging with your Microsoft account, rather it was, would you like the ability to reset your, your password remotely? Yeah. I would be like, oh yeah, that's, that's actually a cool feature. But the fact that it's tied to a Microsoft account and all the different Microsoft products where they're collecting data and they've got well, usage. And I mean, it, it gets messy. But realistically, it should not just be your password. It should be a copy of all your data so that if you lose your phone, you don't lose your data. That's what 90% of customers want. And, and if they want that, they should be able to opt in. I, I agree. It, it, that'd be great. But that's not how it's working. It's not an opt in. It's a oh. you must. I like the way it was in Windows 10 where you could opt out. I think 90% of customers do not even want to opt out. That should be, I think it should be a default, but you should be able to turn it off if you want to. Right. And I'm sure that you'll find a way to hack and turn it off in Windows 11. And then you can tell the what, rest. Me? Me? Yeah. Hack? Windows 11? Oh, oh yeah. That's right. <laughs> of course, the alternative is just don't bother using Windows 11, which is I think what most of us are going to do, just like Vista. If I was running a company, I certainly would have the same thing as going as Vista. Why should we update our stuff to Windows 11, irritate everybody and gain no benefit? Because anyway. they will force us to upgrade in 2025. That's a reason, you're right. Anyway, so Urban's got an NFC flaw. Yes, there is yet another uh, NFC flaw for ATMs. This article doesn't go as deep as I would like it, to get some more technical details as to how that's happening. But it's just it's just another funny, like, okay, it's still happening. It's not getting he, patched. He claims he can jackpot an ATM from a phone with NFC? Yes. He got I want to know it. how. He got to do it on stage, at least. Yeah, he better he better be going to DEF CON and showing us. Yeah, and, and you're the last guy that did it actually had to, like, modify the internals. I think this guy would, too. And that's... And, that's the, the sad part is this article doesn't say, did he modify it or is it just straight up as is? Well, you yeah, know, I, I want to know. You know, I saw a talk at DEF CON and I think it's the Terminator. The kid pulls over. He says, we need some money. So he takes like this thing in a computer and sticks it in the slot and types keys and out comes the money. And he said, I wondered, could I do that? <laughs> and he built some gadget that could do that to some extent. You know, that that's sort of the awesome jackpotting yes. an ATM is sort of the ultimate hack. Anyway. Yes, yes. So hopefully we get some more details either later or at DEF CON. That's where I would expect it. It belongs at DEF CON or Black Hat. Anyway, um, Matthew's got the LinkedIn leak. Why is Microsoft just being attacked this week? Well, just in general, but I mean, they're subject to all the hate, I guess, for big tech. So yes. LinkedIn supposedly has a vulnerability in its API, which has allowed a hacker to scrape the data of 700 million accounts. I'm not really sure how this differentiates just from a nor normal LinkedIn data scraper as if they not do it all the time anyway. But this one seems to be interesting. They claim that it puts your account at risk. So we'll see if um, Microsoft bites the bullet they didn't do passwords, right? It's just oh yeah, it's just on accounts. Yeah, it's just information that you can find, like just by scrolling through a profile. Normally, it's just right. a public profile, so I'm not exactly sure why we're supposed to care. I mean, this is essentially public information anyway. Yeah, it's interesting, but maybe maybe there's something under the hood that we don't know about. No, I think people just try to pretend that this is a problem when you know I don't know what they expect you to do. I mean, in principle, it's publicly available. You could have some kind of rate limiting, but then they'd use a botnet. I mean, how could you even prevent this anyway? I mean, in the end, if you, if, if, if you get hacked, I mean, it's just it's purely to blame on you, pure, poor OPSEC. Like. Well, I remember um, like a decade ago when LinkedIn really got hacked and they got the passwords. Now that I understood was a problem. This I'm not really seeing the problem. Clearly, if you got hacked, it's your fault. Well, see, I, I like I like that. You know, I went, I went into the college on some weekend and I saw this trash can where like the employment office had thrown away a bunch of student resumes. And I was thinking I should shred these. And then I'm thinking, well, actually this is pretty much public information. People are handing these out. And I wasn't, it's the same kind of thing with this stuff. You know, you post your profile on LinkedIn trying to get a job. You want the whole world to see it. So I don't know. Anyway. All right. And Alan's got uh, the BIOS bug for Dell. Yes, Dell has 
a, uh, a, a bug and um, a vulnerability affecting its BIOS Connect app, which is used to update the BIOS in Dell machines. This is a proprietary software that is installed on pretty much every Dell model that's sold today. And Eclipsium, a security company, has identified a couple of very serious vulnerabilities which has a cumulative CVSS score of 8.3, which is pretty high, not the highest, but it's really up there. And uh, in the first scenario, uh, an attacker can uh, leverage insecure TLS connection uh, using this Connect Secure app. And it allows an attacker, presumably on a local network, to uh, intercept that TLS connection and force BIOS Connect to accept a wildcard certificate. So that's a pretty big problem if the attacker is able to insert themselves in a man in the middle position, which would take some doing to accomplish in the first place, it must be said. Uh, the second set of vulnerabilities is some kind of overflow that allows arbitrary code execution and Eclipsium is not divulging the details just yet because they're saving that for their presentation on DEF CON. Uh, but it sounds good. Whatever it is, it sounds like it's pretty good. Um, in the meantime, what everyone should do, the mitigation is very straightforward. Just don't use BIOS Connect. Just don't do that. If you need to update your firmware on your Dell computer, just go ahead and download the executable and do that inside of the Windows operating system and then you'll be fine. Your device will not be vulnerable to at least this set of attacks. So is BIOS Connect on by default? Yes, it's on by default, but you don't necessarily have to use it. Well, yeah, but you do need to turn it off or block it, right? Or somebody else. Oh, you mean you'd have to actually use it for this to happen, okay. I believe so, you have to launch it. I don't I don't know Dell computers, but I believe you. you yeah. um, it's on the desktop and you have to launch it. Yeah, I don't think anybody on earth has automatic BIOS updates. That would be sort of horrible. Yeah, well, that might uh, lead to a few more problems beyond just this. I remember a couple of podcasts ago, we were talking about Microsoft bought uh, Binwalk and they said something like 80% of companies have vulnerable firmware because nobody's been looking at it. So I think, uh, I think there's a lot more of these to be found. Yes, well, you know, I, I think uh, firmware vulnerabilities will be, and f firmware attacks will be the, the next frontier. I think there, there are really a lot of opportunities there and it's very opaque too. There's virtually no open source firmware. There are a few projects out there, but they don't get enough attention and they certainly don't get used enough. So um, I, I think that's, that's gonna be a very rich area for exploitation and yeah, research in the future. Yeah, but it's hard to get to. They're not usually yeah. connected to the internet. That's the thing. That's why I always, this, I mean, 15 years ago, we talked about this. And at that time we figured the number one target would be iPhones and Macs because they really are all exactly the same with the same hardware and the same firmware, whereas PCs really are not. But it didn't turn out to happen. Anyway, so then, uh, right, I, I was just talking to Liz about this yesterday, it caught my attention. People are freaking out about the Delta variant. They're saying, oh my God, we better not go to DEF CON because of the Delta variant of COVID. And I, uh, I might as well see how more, many more people will hate me on Twitter because my, my position is, from a risk analysis perspective, everybody should just forget it and go to DEF CON. If you got the vaccine, the risk is down to being negligible, even against the Delta variant. The Delta variant, you, you have a chance of getting infected with the Delta variant, but it will be an infection that won't hurt you. Your chance of going to the hospital is lowered by like 96% if you had your vaccination. And remember, this thing was only 10 times more deadly than the flu anyway. So once you have decreased the risk by one order of magnitude, it vanishes in the noise, and you don't need to worry. And that's why I hear people saying I need to wear a mask and not let an unvaccinated person come to my dinner gathering because I might get it from that person and then I might pass it to some friend of a friend who might be immunocompromised and can't get the vaccine. I said, yes, that might happen. And you also might get eaten by a bear or hit by an asteroid. The point is those things are not any more likely than they ever have been. And unless you're gonna hide under your bed for the rest of your life, those are the kinds of risks you accept in life. I mean, if you're not vaccinated, like the Republicans in America apparently are happy to die, and who are we to argue with them? They know they're going to die. They had the chance to get the vaccine, and they didn't take it. If you don't take the vaccine, and then you go to DEFCON, you might very well kill yourself, but you're very unlikely to kill anybody else. And 
anyway, that's why I think uh, other people feel very, very strongly that they need to keep hiding, they need to keep wearing masks because there is some huge risk. And I think this is not justified by risk analysis. But there's uh, a lot, there's a lot of people though that got the first vaccine but never got the follow-up. Well, then you've got a problem, right? Then you're not very protected against this. You really have to get both shots. And then you really have nothing to worry about. That's my position. Anyway, I thought I'd state it out there in case anybody cares about my opinion. I think we should resume normal life and conferences and airplane travel and everything as long as you got the full vaccination. <laughs> that was the whole point of the thing. And even with the worst variants, it still works. You're not going to get sick and go to the hospital and die if you got the shots. Anyway, and Caitlin has got ransomware. And you're on mute. I'm on mute. Yes, I, I have ransomware. Um, I, I like ransomware. I don't. Um, I, I, it, yeah, this isn't really about ransomware. So uh, this is about security teams. So Sam, you've been talking a lot about reporters trying to get your hot take on on what's going on with ransomware and stuff, and they're really looking for someone to throw under the bus to make a good headline. And here we go. Here we go. We have. Uh, uh, Mayank uh, Sharma having this article on Tech Radar, saying it's the security teams that are responsible for <laughs> ransomware, uh, because of course they are. It's like the police are responsible for crime. <laughs> how, does that, how does that work? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, we all know that there's a bunch of bad police people, you know, running around. Um, however, we don't necessarily say that they're responsible for crime. Um, and certainly there are some bad security teams. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I would I would blame them for ransomware, but um, so what they're saying is that the, there's all these mistakes that the security teams are doing. And if we just got rid of those mistakes, we wouldn't have ransomware. And those mistakes are they have no patch strategy. They're not patching their systems, which fair enough is actually important. You should patch your systems. Yeah. And they're not understanding what normal traffic looks like, which if you're on a small network, sure. But yeah, try looking at traffic over like a multi um, regional organization <laughs> that sends out terabytes and terabytes of data every second. I mean, come on. Um, and then, of course, the third one is that they rely too much on backups. Um, and instead of, of having a simple solution, like make sure your backups can be written once and not written over again, they're like, you need to do all this stuff with your backups and double check them all the time and all this stuff. And it's like, I don't know. Anyway, so this is what this is what it's come to. Where they're they're really trying to scapegoat, trying to find that simple solution. And, and this is what sells, obviously, is are these really simple solutions where you can point the finger at somebody and say that they just did one thing different, uh, we would be done with this problem. It's like guns, you know. Oh, if we just did this one thing, we get rid of gun violence. Well, unfortunately, the world is not so simple, uh, and. We, well, yeah. you know, if you got rid of the guns, that would stop the gun violence, but you can't do that. This is like, you know, they say if everybody quit drinking alcohol, society would be a lot better. And I said, it probably would, but tough. Yeah. that is not going to happen. Yeah, that, there we go. And, and on that, on that note, if we got rid of all the ransomware yeah. in the world, just deleted it all, we wouldn't have no more ransomware or if it worked problem solved. Or like you said, if everybody just quit paying the ransom, then it would die out. And right, only yeah. a certain number of people would have to be sacrificed for the greater good. Yes, yes. Um, I mean that that's my I, I, my position though is one more of moral purity rather than than necessarily stopping it. Because of course not everyone is going to, you know, not pay. However, I do want to encourage people not to pay for the same reason we don't. It's a good idea not to negotiate with terrorists. It's you know, you, you kind of I don't like rewarding bad guys. You're right, of course. But everybody does the other thing because in each individual case, they have like users and responsibilities and uh, and they figure, well, I need to pay it. It's other people that shouldn't pay it. This is like the solution of most of our problems is for other people to ride the bus so yeah, I can I, drive. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, yeah, and I, I, this was, I found this out firsthand with the vaccine where, every, where I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm one of the, the central employees, so I will, you know, wait patiently until it's my turn, you know, and it's my place and, and, you know, just do the right thing. And everyone around me was like, oh, you know what? I suddenly have this medical condition. I need it right now, <laughs> you know, and they, they they're like, oh no, I, I live in Vacaville. Um, yeah, I just moved there yesterday. I have a PO box, you know, and doing whatever they can to cheat the system to get the vaccine as soon as they could. And I'm like, I am such a sucker. 
I know. I remember being young and idealistic and self-sacrificing. And then I got old and bitter and cynical as I became the authority figure. And I found out how totally corrupt it all is. And I said, it's just a disorganized mess of puppies pushing forward to get the milk. And if you don't push forward, you die. There's no plan at all. You know, we could have had a plan. They should have just emailed me a letter that said, your number is 1 million and seven. It'll come on this date. Wait for your turn. That would have worked. But there was no plan at all. It was, it was just a mob pushing up towards the bar, trampling one another. Anyway. Um, all right. And so now we got, uh, Irvin has got more, oh, the new stuff in Windows 11. Yeah, the new exciting stuff that should make us get Windows 11. Let's oh, hear it. Oh, don't, don't get your hopes up at all. <laughs> so these, this little, little blog uh, has three utilities that, uh, like two or three of the, two of them, you could already do in PowerShell. They've just been converted into one tool. Uh, so there's a disk usage tool. Ooh. There's a, uh, one that's equivalent for uh, storage spaces. Uh, storage spaces? Storage spaces is basically software RAID. A local RAID? Yeah, a local software RAID. Oh, okay. So it, it's using uh, ReFS or something? I forget, but something like that, yeah. And there's a couple more uh, commandlets now in PowerShell. This is the exciting thing, Sam, that, that everybody has to update to Windows 11. You want more commandlets that are so crazy to understand. And you want to be able to know your disk usage and your space usage in storage, in uh, storage spaces. Well, you know, just storage spaces is at least the 10th weird way to store files Microsoft has had. Before this, they had briefcase, and then they had offline files. And there were a bunch of others, these weird things that were almost like Dropbox, except they don't work. Anyway. Yep. Yep. All right. Anyway, and then uh, Matthew's got a Facebook for a trillion dollars. Well, it seems like big tech is being largely successful this week because not only did Facebook hit one trillion, Microsoft also hit two trillion this oh, week. So Microsoft. I did not know Microsoft are, was Facebook. Mm -hmm, they are definitely grabbing all the big bucks from whatever they have to announce. It's mostly Azure, I think. I believe so. That but I, I believe they also hit it the same day they um, they announced Windows 11. So I think that might have, might have had to play a part as well. All the little things just building up. Yeah, the thing that got me impressed, the whole reason Facebook went to a trillion is because they totally got away with their antitrust stuff. The FTC, I think, just totally struck the lost in court. So they're not going to get punished for trust, which is what I was afraid of. So their stock went up. Yeah, but I mean, a trillion company, trillion dollar companies, and the whole U.S. economy is, I think, $20 trillion. So, uh, big tech's like what? A good portion of that? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Maybe it's more than 20 trillion. I, I had a map of it up here because that's compared to China. But these numbers are interesting because, you know, Democrats are talking about spending six trillion on this, and we're trying, and there's big argument is that really too much money or is that not too much money? And, uh, Nobody really seems to know. I guess we're going to find out. Anyway, um, and Alan's got uh, EA. Yes, Electronic Arts, the gaming mega corporation, seems to have a DNS problem. CyberPion, a small cybersecurity research firm, has found that they have over 500 DNS misconfigurations and that a number of subdomains are vulnerable to takeover. Um, everything like occo.ea.com and uh, some football that is say soccer related domains it's just a, a lot of stuff that they haven't been um, keeping tidy shall we say their, their housekeeping has been very poor and this could result in a number of vulnerabilities that affect say users uh, they could fall victim to cross-site scripting attacks for example or it could be leveraged for various uh, phishing attacks by, say, um, attackers pretending to be uh, EA employees and then targeting other companies, for example, uh, which could then be leveraged for, I don't know, ransomware attacks. At any rate, EA seems to be thinking that this is not a big deal and they haven't really treated this as a serious problem. 
it seems to indicate that EA has some kind of internal security issues. Of course, EA was compromised via some uh, Slack, uh, Slack account uh, compromise not too long ago. And now they've got all this DNS trouble with these 500, perhaps 500 different uh, issues with the DNS. It sounds like they've got some issues in-house that they need, need to get cleaned up and uh, it will affect them directly. And it might also affect some of their vendors and customers too. Yeah, this reminds me of an article that came out a couple of years ago where they said the number one predictor of security vulnerabilities is organizational chaos, where people don't, you know, clean things up and keep things tidy and know who the boss is and have a clear workflow and chain of command. If people are just doing random stupid things and other people don't know about it, that's how you create security vulnerabilities. And I really think that sounds very true. Yes, yes. And I, that shouldn't come entirely as a surprise because uh, these triple A game producing uh, companies, they tend to have a, um, a very interesting hiring model in which they have these crunches, um, like two year long crunches in which they try to produce uh, or finalize a game. And they will hi hire thousands and thousands of developers to work on a game. And as soon as the game is done or published, then they'll lay them all off. It's and uh, it's like gig work. Yeah, it's like gig work. And um, it's not just EA, of course. They're, all the big studios are, are guilty of doing this. But they seem to have a very particular attitude about how they treat their employees. Um, the employees that are producing the games. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if they have a very similar attitude to their IT staff and security staff. Yeah, this is like a common trend because I know um, Activision Blizzard did the same thing. They, um, ever since the whole merger, they've laid off a good amount of their employees in terms of budget cuts, supposedly, but they end up hiring Activision employees afterwards. And it's just a cycle of every, every time a new game or every time a new expansion comes out for a game. It's just a constant cycle of workers come in and then workers go out. Yeah, yeah a lot of people in the gig economy. Yeah, it's a gig economy or it's a disposable workforce. And because there are relatively few players in that AAA space, I guess they can get away with it. Well, I would expect a bunch of them to be outsourced too to make it cheaper. Yeah, I don't know if they can outsource very effectively just because of the, the complexities of the work. Um, and I don't know if they need to outsource for that matter. There seems to be a ton of money in games. I, they can be much more profitable than movies. So there is certainly money to be made in this, in this space. Especially like lately, that. movies have been taking a hit, I think. Yeah, that's that's. True. I know I certainly spend way more money on games than I do movies. I have not, well, of course I haven't gone to the theater, but even if it was normal, I, I don't go to the theater that often. I probably go once every three months but a game if, if i see a sale i'm going to buy it if i see an expansion i'm going to buy it if there's something cool that i like i'm probably going to buy it so it caters a lot more toward the younger audience who i believe is has a lot more purchasing power yeah and i think uh the pundits i listen to say that movies are never coming back because of the pandemic everybody upgraded their home entertainment system and they found out how great it is to just stay at home and more than half of them are just not going to go back to the movies. Why would you? So I don't know. Anyway, all right. Well, that's it for this one. And we'll be back on Friday. Farewell. <laughs>